pretty popular. Oops, sorry. Just hit that, right. everybody, <laughs> and you'll be fine. Um, all right, is everybody muted who, uh, who's there? Which would be good. Uh, at any rate, uh, I just lost his page. I gotta, I'm you muted yourself. Yeah, no, it's coming. Oh, sorry. No, that was me. <laughs> you got to unmute Tom. How about now? You're good. All right. I don't know about that, but I'm there. Uh, at any rate, let me find his uh, info again. There was just there. Uh, this uh, Pro Nature Honduras Foundation uh, started a few years ago that uh, Robert will tell you more about. He is not just a butterfly person. He is a naturalist from uh, of, of uh, many ilks. He published the birds of Honduras uh, in both English and then in Spanish a couple of years uh, later, just in 2018 or so, 2019. Uh, he is working on orchids uh, as well. He is developing programs to uh, get more butterfly conservation going uh, with butterfly houses, raising butterflies and uh, helping them out there. He's discovered at least uh, two or three and probably by now up to 10 new species or <laughs> unnamed species. The number of butterflies in Honduras sounds absolutely frightening and spectacular for what most of us think is a kind of a little bit of a country, but the diversity uh, seems remarkable and we are very much interested in hearing more about that. So let me just turn this over please to Robert. Again, if you've got questions, just type them into the chat room and we'll get to them at the end of his presentation. Uh, Robert, thank you very much for coming with us uh, here and uh, go ahead. All right, um, let's see. Somebody there, somebody there is gonna have to give me the share screen option. I think, it, I think it's already there. Okay, great. So, so anyway, thanks to Tom, um, Rosemary, Barbara, I've been in touch with several people and Really grateful for being able to have this opportunity to show you a little bit about the butterflies of Honduras and some of the work that we've been doing here with butterflies over the past six years. So I'll, I'll just go straight into the, the presentation here. We've got a lot of pictures to show you and some stories to tell. So Probably help if we got all the way to the beginning. Mm -hmm. So you seeing the full screen there? It's not full screen, but it's uh, it's pretty visible. Uh, it, it should be full screen. Hold on. Maybe these things have to kind of get uh, try this again. Oh no. Same. Uh, you're not on. Okay. Let's try it again. And the trick very tricky getting the full. Uh, Rosemary says if you, you just need to hit the slideshow or the play slideshow uh, up on the top. And if my Spanish was better, I could tell you exactly which one. Let's see the I'm not probably but, under presentation. It's not under full screen yet. This no. is full. This is full screen, but we can see your slides uh, from your PowerPoint on the left as well as the main image in the center. That's what I'm trying to get rid of. <laughs> I was going to say, is it not under presentation con diapositivas? Is it not under that? It should be up there, I think. Yeah, or on the bottom. It could be on the bottom too, right in the bottom. There's a. I, I believe you can just X out in the upper left hand corner um, to the right of your uh, title slide. There's a little X. All the way left, left, up. Right. Presentation. Oh, down, 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 <laughs> a little bit. Right. A little to the right. A little up. tiny X. Up a little bit higher. Right there. There. What? Try that.
Perfecto. Is that good? Hola. That's fine. Are we good there? Bueno, bueno. Okay. All right. So let's get started here. So that there's a screenshot there of our, our first endemic butterfly. It's called Elizabeth fire tip. It was the very first species I discovered uh, in, in the country. It's new for science. So a lot of us have humble beginnings, you know, when, when you get into nature, whether it's birds or butterflies or orchids or odonates, any of that. And so my beginnings and in, in all of uh, loving nature, appreciating nature started when I was about 10 years old, a uh, little kid in California. Uh, my mom made me a butterfly net at my request and it ran all over the place around the neighborhoods and Ventura County catching butterflies and even in national parks on camping trips. <laughs> I had little collections going, but it, but it all served to, to a good purpose. So you can see a couple of pictures of me there as a little kid with butterfly nets running all over the place. And at our exposure to birds, as well as a, as a young person in, in junior high, saw a male Western tanager from my classroom window at the beginning of biology class and actually knew what it was. So that was kind of neat. So my parents bought me all these, uh, out of these um, I think they're Audubon guides when they first started coming out with books with photographs in them, butterflies and birds, or it might've been Peterson. And so I had a, a really good exposure as a kid to at least the nature in, in California and, and in the Western US. So that carried on with me pretty much throughout my youth. And by the time I got to the point where I wanted to go to college and study something, I said, well, I want to be out in the outdoors somewhere, maybe work in a national park or something, and ended up going to junior college. Uh, Ended up finishing at Humboldt State University in California with a degree in natural resources, planning and interpretation. And from there, I went straight into Honduras uh, as a Peace Corps volunteer and stayed for three years. Normal service is for two years. And so I stayed a third year uh, to actually work on a big project. It was the country's first uh, butterfly farm. And so it was a uh, financed by a nonprofit organization in conjunction with the San Diego uh, Wild Animal Park. And they helped the community in far eastern Honduras build a butterfly farm and they were exporting pupa to the Wild Animal Park. And so that was uh, kind of fortuitous and a lot of experiences and exposure to early exposures to the butterflies of Honduras. So after Peace Corps, I went straight back to Honduras um, I actually tried my hand at working with butter, rearing butterflies, and I wanted to export pupa to butterfly houses, and it just wouldn't work. There were just too many problems, competition with Costa Rica, and other issues. And so I decided if I was going to stay in the country, and if it wasn't going to be with butterflies, I better figure out what I'm going to do. <laughs> so a friend of mine, he got me into guiding. Um, a group that came down from Washington, Robert Ridgely was on this board for a nonprofit out of Washington that was thrown into guiding head first as the country's expert on the birds. There were no bird guides here and there were no books, there was nothing. And so at that, that, that moment, that was the year 2000, I re then realized that, wow, people actually pay to go look at birds. <laughs> it's like, okay, so I better learn the birds if I'm gonna stay here in the country. So I went head first into the birds and learned everything on my own. Uh, like I said, there were no books. I had to carry three to four books uh, with me from Costa Rica, Panama, and the US uh, to be able to identify all the birds that are here in Honduras. And so I ran around all the country as much as I could learning all the birds on my own. And I spent six years recording uh, doing audio recordings of birds and professional equipment, and I learned all the bird sounds as well. And so after about 15 years of work, uh, in 2015, uh, it was time to do our first bird book. So the, the English edition came out in early 2015. And it was totally self-published and self-financed book. And then within a couple of years after that, 
we, we went and translated the whole book word for word into a full Spanish edition. So that's a, that's a 600 page book with 73 color plates. So that was basically more than 20 years of, of bird work. So I don't like to be bored as a lot of people know that. I don't sit around. And so I said, I wanna get back into my butterflies. Um, after the bird books came out, there were now like 12 grassroots bird watching clubs in the country. I helped found the Honduran Ornithological Association uh, under USAID contracts. I trained almost all the bird watching guides in the country, taught them how to be professional bird guides. So after so many years and years of doing all the bird work, we kind of felt that there were enough people doing all this now. It was time to just to step aside and get back to my childhood passion, which is butterflies. And so all these years I've been looking at butterflies and just kind of informally documenting um, some species, but now it's time to really get down and, and do it on a more on a more scientific level. And so really not even quite seven years ago, we really started getting into the, the butterflies and, and working, they're working on them pretty much steadily since then. So basically in the world, the tropics are the most species rich areas and uh, anywhere in the tropics, you have the Asian tropics, the African and the new world tropics, but it's the new world tropics that have the most species rich forest per given acre or hectare, however you want to, however you want to measure it. And so in, this, in the world, there are about 25,000 plus species, depend, depending on who you're talking to, but about 8,300 plus are found in the New World tropics alone. Yeah, just a second, but we're still on the first slide. I don't know if you've advanced any. Um, so maybe you need to uh, go to the bottom right-hand part of your screen and hit the slide. It looks like a the slide screen. Yeah, now we're seeing the second slide. Yeah, that should that should get you there. Or go to. Um, I'm still seeing the upper part. Um, yeah, it should be that one there. Okay, we lost it somewhere. Let's yeah go back to the beginning here. I might have to close that. Let's see what happens. Idea, idea how big Honduras is, is about the size of the state of Tennessee. It's about 40 something thousand square miles. And so we are, Honduras is located in Northern Central America. Uh, Nicaragua and Costa Rica and Panama are just to the South of us. And then what abuts us is El Salvador, Guatemala and Belize. So if you, if you take a closer look at the actual topography of Honduras, you can see all those big brown areas. Those are uh, mountain ranges. And the green areas are fairly low flying flat areas. And then in between all the mountains, kind of grayish areas, those are in the valleys. So Honduras is very different than the countries to the south of us, especially Costa Rica and Panama, because they were formed by the crushing actions of two tectonic. They have mountain ranges that pretty much run you know, straight through the center of the countries that more or less neatly divide the Atlantic or the Caribbean from the Pacific. And also Honduras was actually crushed by three major plates. So we have mountain ranges that run all kinds of different directions, east to west, diagonal, and we have ice, these isolated masses in different parts of the country. And so, you know, as most people know, the, the actual orientation of mountain ranges you know, helps determine rainfall, soil type, and ultimately the types of plants that you can find on different slopes 
and that determines your butterfly and insect population. And so we find been finding that some somewhat with birds, but a lot with butterflies, that we're finding typical Pacific slope butterflies way up on the Atlantic side, and sometimes vice versa, butterflies that you find in the Caribbean slope way in and far, far away from, from the Caribbean coast. And so another feature that you can see in this picture with those red lines, it's called the Honduran Depression, uh, which I talk about quite a bit in the bird book, but this is kind of like a neat dividing line that separates Western Honduras from Central and Eastern Honduras. And so there was a, a pattern that was developing that was very obvious with the birds that we shared uh, birds from Western Honduras up through Guatemala and Mexico in the Southern US. And then Central and Eastern Honduras is more similar to Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. And so this dividing line, even though there's similar habitats on both sides, some species weren't crossing the lines and we still don't know why, we have no idea why. And so we started doing the butterfly work and the butterflies were following the exact same pattern as the birds. And so Honduras uh, is what I term or coin is the Darien Gap of Northern Central America. So all these countries have some kind of overlap, but in terms of birds, we, we have out of our 800 species, we have 120 species that have their Northern, their typical Northern and Southern range limits in Honduras. Um, and with butterflies, I think we're already up over two to 200 species that have their southern and northern range limits in the country. So it makes it a very, very fascinating place to work um, because of the topography, it's just, it's just so different. And if you look also in this picture on the far right, that kind of big, there's a big green area. Uh, that is a huge wilderness. That is a place that we call the little Amazon of Central America. It is millions of acres of rainforest, which is uh, contiguous on with Nicaragua. There are these pine grass savannas, which is kind of like your Everglades in Florida. That uh, ecosystem alone is 6,000 square miles of these Caribbean pine savannas. And uh, scarlet macaws breed in the pine trees out there, believe it or not. They nest in pine trees. So a lot of fascinating stuff. So if you have ever see the bird book, there's a big fold out map uh, in the back in a pocket. And one side has just a very rough diagram of, of the ecosystems and the, a lot of cloud forest here, a lot of pine oak forest, very, very different uh, than the countries to the south of us. So when we started our bird work more than six years ago, we had not much to go off of. There was this list published by Florida in 2012. It was basically what we were working off of, uh, generated by the McGuire Center. They did numerous trips, mostly to the North Coast, and they published uh, the first modern list of the butterflies in Maas of Honduras. And so there were 861 species that they had uh, documented for the country. And we knew that was way, way less than what should be here. So we started going all over the country, um, you know, on a shoestring budget, wherever we could go, whenever we could go. And we started collecting. Uh, we got a research pit permit from the government to do what we do. And for the purposes of, you know, we were eventually wanted to do a butterfly book we really had to collect in a country where almost nothing is known uh, of its butterflies. Um, and we know there's a lot of cryptic species and there were probably new species for science. We had to have at least a representative uh, collection, make a collection. Um, a lot of common species, we may have one or two of in the collection and that's it. But we are really focusing on skippers, which a lot of people don't pay attention to. Uh, metal marks and hair streaks, a lot of the little butterflies. And so that's uh, actually most of our collection is, is comprised of, of those families. But early on, we also started getting some help from uh, Hondurans for the most part, young people. Uh, now they weren't collecting, they were all out there 
sometimes part of their work, sometimes just hobbies. And they were running into, into butterflies and they would take pictures and send them to us. And so some of these people have really helped, helped us document a lot of rare butterflies. They've gotten a lot of new butterflies for Honduras, a lot of country records. And so a lot of their photos will, will appear in our, in our forthcoming book. There's a few, few of the pictures there that belong to other people. Quite a few of those were, were country records at that time. So it's been great to, to involve different people uh, in this project. So as, as we kept going, we kept working along. Um, it didn't take us long to, to personally, Olivia and I, we've added over 300 country records uh, to the list. And along with the help of some of those other people you saw, I think they added like a hundred something. So we're, we're now up to 1,270 species within a very short period of time. Um, I also generated a list of species that are that could be here or should be here. That's actually almost 500 species. So the number you see there, if we're, we're now at 1,270 species. You can add almost four to 500 on top of that. So there's, there's still a lot of work to do here. <laughs> So as I said, it, we started generating or you know, making a collection. Um, we work with various scientists from around the world, Bernard Hermier, French guy lives in South America. We have a friend in the Smithsonian, numerous people and scientists that have been um, just wonderful resources in, in helping with butterfly identification. Uh, there's another guy that does molecular work and genitalia work for us who's helped us uh, publish undescribed, previously undescribed species. So what you're seeing there are just some of the skippers in the collection. <laughs> Nobody likes to do skippers, but we have to learn those things. So when COVID hit, the whole world froze up, but we never missed a heartbeat. We still went into the field where we could, still kept doing a lot of our work. And I also took the time to really work on the collection that we have, they're all in professional Cornell cases and everything very well cared for. And just started working on a database, a digital database for the collection. So this is a screenshot of the database of just a very tiny piece of it. Right now it's up to 8,000 entries. And so every single photograph we have of living individuals and every single specimen has a code. And that's all shown uh, here with a Scientific names got its code, where we caught the butterfly or where it was photographed, when, where, uh, habitat, elevation, male, female, and notes, or if it belonged to somebody else. And so that took about three months to do, to start this digital database for the butterflies of Honduras. So here's an, an example. So you can see there that in the red circle, there's a code, the longer codes represent photographs. And that code belongs to this butterfly here. It's a very special hair streak. And it's the only photograph we have of this one particular hair streak, a uh, very, very rare butterfly here. And so that butterfly, that actual picture that you see there, that's the raw image from one of our files was turned into this for the book. And so it's been a long process. In fact, two thirds of our, our database are actually photographs. So out of our 8,000 plus entries in the database, two thirds of those are photographed. So the whole country is divided into regions. Every region has six folders, one for each family. <laughs> and then there's a whole folder for photographs from other people. And that's divided into six folders, one for each family. <laughs> So it's been a mega, mega project, keeping all this stuff organized and without, without messing things up. It's been a huge project. So just real briefly, I will show you, we have the same six families that you have there in North America, just, just a few more species in each family. So we have the skippers, we're up to over 470 something species. There are a lot of little brown and black jobs, uh, but there are a lot of, Beautiful skippers here as well. 
and just the collage of just a few of the skippers that we have, all different sizes. Wing shapes don't vary much except for some of the tailed skippers. There's several uh, genera of tailed skippers here. And like I said, that's the group that a lot of people ignore because they are so difficult. I'd say probably half our skippers, I probably couldn't have identified without the help of Bernard, extremely difficult group to work with, very, very hard. But we do have flashy things like this, this little pretty thing that we see only once or twice a year. We also have another group called uh, scarlet eyes and there's ruby eyes. These are crepuscular and semi-nocturnal skippers. And we'll get back to them in, probably in a few minutes because that's a really, really special group of butterflies. And beautiful skipper. This one wasn't hard to identify. So. <laughs> then the next biggest family are the brushfoots. 350 species there. And this is the most diverse family. Uh, you can see the glass wings there are in there, the owls, the 88s, all the long wings like the zebras, the dagger wings, all the wood nymphs, the morphos, the zebras, all the firecrackers. So it's a very, very, very diverse family divided into numerous subfamilies. And it's a very pretty one, actually very common in, in our yard. We let, we know what the host plant is and we let them grow everywhere, including almost on our front porch. That's the male. This is a clear-winged satyr. This is the only species of clear-winged uh, satyr we have known, so far known in the country. Beautiful little thing found here, close to where I live as well. 88s, there are many species of 88s and, and different genera. Don't get to see the top side very often, it's mostly the bottom side. Then we get into the hair streaks. This is a very special family. Um, when we started doing uh, the work, there were only, I think, 81 species known from the country. Hair streaks, probably more than skippers, is probably the hardest family to study here because a lot of them live in the canopy. And a lot of these things are highly, highly seasonal. And to find these things or to be able to see them without using uh, canopy towers and that kind of stuff is very hard. But we have found numerous places in the country where there have been there are flowering phenomena, and some of that I actually write about in the book, um, where that has allowed us to document many canopy dwelling hair streaks at ground level. And so two or actually three of those plants we have here on the property where you get to see beautiful, beautiful things like this right there at ground level. <laughs> and so we've added over 100 species uh, just in the hair streak family alone. A great, great group of butterflies. Not all of them have the big frilly tails. And so we have uh, ones like you have in Florida, the, the Atala, I believe it's called. So there are a couple of different species of those here. Um, and then lots of, lots of plain ones, but most of them are blue and purple on the top side and blues, we have, we have some blues here, not as many as there are in North America. And then some fancy little hair streaks like this. Another nice one. So there's a property uh, adjacent to ours, which is the second most studied property in the country. And we've discovered a phenomenon that occurs each year in the dry season where sometimes hundreds and hundreds of hair streaks of many, many species come out of the canopy and rest in the shade of this coffee plantation. And it's, a, and it's an amazing phenomenon to see. And so this year we had, uh, we had actually offered a trip to the Highlands and Hair Streaks of Honduras, where you get to see quite a, quite a few of these hair streaks at ground level. So it's a lot of fun. There's a beautiful hair streak that's um, fairly common on our property. Beautiful, beautiful thing. We get down to metal marks. You've got a, a few species up there, the Mormon metal mark, uh, the red bordered I got to see in Texas. That was a lifer for me. Uh, that's a very, also a very diverse family here, hundred more than 150 species. There's a picture of just a few of them. 
with different colors. Uh, some, there's a few with tails as well. Hair, metal mark can also be very tough. There are many, many canopy dwelling species. I would say, I just a rough guess, maybe half the metal marks, maybe even more hide under leaves inside the rainforest. So they're very, very hard to find. So a lot of times we're just walking around in the forest with a stick, tapping branches and leaves to flush some of these hair, these metal marks up. And quite often they'll land nearby underneath the leaf. And then we can see what they are and photograph them. And we also flush up a lot of skippers, a lot of rainforest skippers hide under leaves as well. There's one of our fancy <laughs> metal marks. There are several genera of these with the little fur furry legs. Those are wonderful things with little coppery and gold spotting on the bottom. Beautiful things. Uh, another metal mark that's actually common, fairly common on our property. Uh, usually you see several on our mist flowers. Obviously this is a zinnia right, right in our front yard. Beautiful little thing. And there's a nice, another nice one with tails. Lots of beautiful metal marks. Till the family started getting smaller down into the sulfurs, more than 50 species. Quite a few, quite a variety in there uh, in terms of wing shapes and colors. They're not all whites and yellows. So you can see in that picture there, uh, quite a few different color forms. The one in the lower right, the top side, actually looks like a zebra longwing. It's black and yellow striped. And the male is white. So actually, in this case, the female is, is prettier than the male. And then the one in the lower left, if you look at it, it's actually black, orange, and yellow. And that's part of a huge mimicry complex, which is just a whole other topic altogether, Batesian mimicry and, and malarian mimicry. Um, and so that mimics the distasteful clearing butterflies. So all those, all their larvae feed on nightshades and they're all distasteful or poisonous to certain predators. And so there are many moths and butterflies that mimic those distasteful uh, clear wings. Beautiful sulfur here, very typical sulfur. They're, it's a highland group. And we have one species of clear winged sulfur. This is a sulfur. <laughs> And it's the only species in the, in the world. It ranges, I think, from Southern Mexico, I think, to Northern Colombia. Uh, and it flies together with the true clear wings or the glass wings, uh, except this one sits on six legs. Uh, and, the true, and the glass wings, they're nymphalids, they rest on four legs. And so when you see one perch, you say, oh, that's the sulfur and it's not the glass wing. This is one that's on our property as well. And the tiger white, this is actually a sulfur, another one that mimics the distasteful glass wings. Swallowtails, this is our smallest family. And you've got kite swallowtails up there. We have quite a few species here. Uh, swallowtails, different genera that have no tails at all. Varieties, uh, the cattle hearts. So most of the, those don't have tails. I think this is one that reaches the southern U.S. Some, somewhere, swallowtail, similar to your zebra swallowtail. And then uh, just gigantic, gorgeous species, this one that lives in the cloud forest, magnificent swallowtail. So but those are basically the six families of butterflies, just a few photographs of each of the six. But getting back to some of the work we did, um, Early on, we spent a lot of time in the field going, especially to highland areas, because we knew that we would find a lot of the, the country records. Uh, it didn't take us long to realize that there was a lot more here than we realized. So there's a picture of me there in the back of the truck that was at the moment, uh, was that over four years ago, when we found the country's first uh, endemic undescribed species. And so I had been to that certain mountain for almost 20 years, but on bird watching tours. Uh, and I never noticed that butterfly because it wasn't there. And the reason was because we always went there in the birding season, which ran until about February or mid-April. 
this butterfly comes out at the end of April and onward. So it was it was it wasn't that I wasn't paying attention to the butterflies. It's because it wasn't out, and so I, I found this butterfly, and then we went afterwards, and then there were a whole bunch of them feeding on the same mountain fuchsia that all the hummingbirds were feeding on. And so that's where we found our country's first endemic. Uh, a friend of ours named that after his mother. His mother's name was, was Elizabeth, uh, named it in honor of his mother. And then this one is named after my mother who's sitting just to the right of me here. <laughs> so this is butterfly is only known from our property. <laughs> I found that just shortly after I found that fire tip skipper on our mist flowers. As soon as I saw it, I had a gut feeling that this was something new for science because it didn't look like any other butterfly in that genus. Uh, sent the leg up for DNA work and sure enough, it was uh, new for science. So in the first 14 months of doing field work, we already had three new species for science. And so that just tells us there's a lot more out there than, than we realize. So we're just still really at the uh, tip of the iceberg in, in terms of what we're doing here. And so in uh, June of last year, in the magazine or the publication Tropical Lepidoptera, uh, is when the first, our, two of our new species got published. So that's, I mean, you can imagine as being as a kid at 10 years old catching butterflies, You'd never imagine finding new butterflies for science and publishing it. So it's, it's, uh, it's been an honor, a privilege to be able to do this kind of stuff. Um, you can see Nick Grishin's name there. Um, he's the scientist who, who did all the molecular work and, and his assistants, you know, the, uh, the gen genitalia work as well. So that's, uh, those are our first two publications and there are more on the way. <laughs> And here's another one that's new for science. I found it in the village um, where Olivia's parents are from, just literally down the road from where their house is. This little, little skipper found it down at the creek that's under uh, investigation right now, molecular work. This is a great story as a friend of ours. Uh, yeah, he moves in the States now, but he would go all over with us and photograph butterflies. He was doing some kind of environmental fair at a little school up in the mountains, same mountain where we found the fire tip skipper. And during lunch break, walked into this field and photographed that little brown thing that looks like a California ringlet. <laughs> hard, to see, hard to believe that that's a hair streak. So I knew it was a hair streak and that was about it. And I said, oh, that belongs, I think, to the Arawakis genus, I think. And I sent it to the guy at the Smithsonian. And he looked at it and said, Robert, this is another new butterfly for science. <laughs> so um, we were only able to find a couple of those in two days of searching. So as soon as he sent me this photograph, I called my friend Roger. I said, Roger, you got a new one for science. I'll be there in like three hours. <laughs> And so we found a couple, that was it. We went looking for the larva and the host plant, which is a, should have been, it's a nightshade, but we we're looking in the wrong place. We were looking on the edge of the roads and we found larva of a different kind of hair streak. It wasn't this one. And then a year afterwards, another friend of ours at another site, actually inside a national park, he sends me photographs of the same butterfly. He said, Robert, this is the same one that you found with Roger, right? Yes, because I found the plant and the larva. I go, really? I go, don't tell anybody. <laughs> there was actually presence of a, another university there uh, here in the country. And we did not want this one to get scooped on us. So we, this was actually the only butterfly we, we kept secret under our hats until very recently. Um, this is the only one of our new butterflies that we're able to discover and describe all the early stages. And so the, there's larva there and the pupa and the measurements, and that's gonna, gonna get published someday. And so it's, this butterfly was actually using a huge shrub-like nightshade, almost like a small tree inside the forest. And so we were looking at, at the wrong place the whole time. So it was, it was fun to watch all the interactions of males patrolling their plant with females would come in and lay their eggs. So that'll get published someday as well. And so while we were working on the book, we went and saw a couple of collections in the country. 
And in one collection, there was this one metal mark sitting there that they've had since 2007. And I sent the photograph of this to a metal mark expert. And he said, that's new for science as well. And that we'll probably name that after the guy who collected it. It's, a, it's an, a retired American here. He did a lot of butterfly work on the North Coast. So quite a few, quite a few species under investigation. And we know there's more out there. So how much do we really know about the butterflies in Honduras? As I said, we're probably just barely skimming the iceberg, um, tip of the iceberg. This is another example here. Uh, this skipper, it's one of these crepuscular things. It was uh, formerly endemic to Costa Rica, the Guanacaste region in Costa Rica. Uh, we found it, uh, we found two on our property. It's also up in Belize. Another skipper that was also supposed to be another endemic to Costa Rica. Uh, we found it on the North Coast um, during two different years in the exact same spot. So that was sent off to different people and they said, that's the same one that's in Costa Rica. Okay. We found this skipper uh, on our property comes to our mist flowers every year. And this skipper is the only one in its genus and, and appears, reappears in Peru in South America. So they're still not quite sure if this is the same species in Peru or not. Uh, I think they're gonna do, continue doing molecular work on it. And this satire, this wood nymph, also on our property, there's one historical record for Panama, that's it. And then this one reappears in Bolivia. And this one is found all year long on our property. Its larva feeds on the native bamboo up on the ridge line. So we, we really don't, I mean, we think we know a little bit, but we have many, many more years of work to do before I think we get a really good handle on what's here in the country. But a pattern started developing not, not too long ago where we were finding a lot of butterflies that were not even recorded for Nicaragua, which is not surprising. There's not really a lot of butterfly work going on down there. And so we were finding a lot of butterflies that were only known from Costa Rica and Panama, way up in central and, and, and northern Honduras. And so that list I generated species that, that could or should, should be here is, uh, has incremented quite a bit. So now we get down in, into our neck of woods. So if you look in that picture there, that little building down there is our house. So we own the Emerald Valley International Butterfly Center. We have 50 acres of what you're looking at there. We live in a pre-montane forest, which is a mid-elevation mid forest. And so we have this huge mixing of highland and lowland species right where we live. Uh, not far from us, there's some dry forest and pine forest. So we get some of these other species that wander into our property, like southern dog face and giant white. It's things that do not live or breed inside a, a wet rainforest. And so if you look at the figure there, we've uh, out of our 310 country records, 119 come from our property, uh, plus uh, the endemic, uh, my mom's emesis. Metal mark is only known from our property. That butterfly is being nominated and should be going up onto the IUCN red list uh, in, the, in the near future. We have 704 species on our property. <laughs> so that's kind of hard to fathom. Um, there are 725 species known from the uh, Canada and the lower 48 in the US. We have 704 on 50 acres. <laughs> So it's kind of mind boggling those numbers. Um, we had no idea that the diversity was as high when we lived here, when we bought, we've made three separate purchases here. Uh, when we got to 500, we were blown away and that list kept climbing and climbing. And then we hit 600 <laughs> and I said, we're never gonna hit 700. In January of this year, we hit 700 species. <laughs> We started monitoring, monitoring two other different native plants. One's called bitter vine, which I, I think is in the U.S. as well. Um, another flowering shrub called Baraginaceae. It's called black sage. 
And so some of those started getting big and blooming and recorded some extremely rare hair streaks and metal marks on, on some of these other plants. And that's when we hit uh, 700 this past January. Okay. So incredible, incredible diversity here. So where you, where you saw the picture of our house, this is what it used to look like. It was a corn and bean field on the lower slopes. Uh, so when we bought the place, we didn't have to plant anything. The forest regener regenerated completely on its own. I mean, the seed source was nearby, the rainforest, the birds were there. Um, and so the forest came back all by itself. Uh, within three or four years, there were trees that were more than 30 feet tall. So the jungle was encroaching in upon our house and does every day. So there's our house, a drone picture there. It used to be a corn and, and bean field. We get down to the, the mist flower power. Um, so any of you have ever been down to the south and to the Texas festival, they have numerous species of, of mist flower type plants. Those are all asters uh, in the sunflower family. So right here behind our back door five years ago, I accidentally discovered this one plant that was growing and it was producing flowers and it was attracting an amazing amount of butterflies. I had, I had no idea what a mist flower was. And so from that day onward, our gardener had strict instructions not to cut anything that was sprouting out of the ground that even looked similar to that plant. Um, and so now uh, a friend of ours knows how to propagate the plant. We have multiple mist flower gardens on our property. And we've helped another friend on his property develop mist flower gardens as well. And that is the most incredible plant we have here in the, in the neotropics. And it attracts species from all six families of butterflies, some swallowtails, um, but all these other families, they just, that's just like a candy store for them. So that is a photograph of one, a part of one of our mist flower gardens. So you can imagine having this incredible plant in the middle of the rainforest, where you have 700 species of butterflies is right now we're going to have the biggest bloom cycle that we've ever had in, uh, in five years. Uh, we've got more big plants that we ever had and there are thousands and thousands of buds on our plants right now. So we're, we're, we think we're going to have a huge mist flower bloom season this year. It's just an incredible phenomenon and you literally clouds of butterflies that, uh, that just fly all around you. So at one point we decided, well, heck, let's do a butterfly festival. <laughs> and so almost four years ago, we held our first butterfly festival. It was all Hondurans and a lot of local people. And you can see there we're standing in the mud. <laughs> we still had a great time. And uh, this January will be our, our fourth annual uh, butterfly festival. Last event, we had seven international visitors, which was wonderful. And we had, we recorded, I think we were just shy of 300 species in five days. So incredible, incredible event. And so I was mentioning to somebody before we got started, we just don't hold the festival. We, we invite community members down to get to see part of the, the collection that on, on display. We have kids come down and have a coloring contest. We usually have a photography contest uh, for youth and with uh, great prizes in there, little digital camera, original artwork. And so it's just a lot you know, more than just coming and looking at you know, a lot of pretty butterflies. We try to involve some of, some of the local people. And this year, I think there are gonna be some mayors showing up and some news reporters and stuff. So little by little, people are uh, getting more awareness about the butterflies the birds is just taken off of the publication of the bird book, but now we're trying to get them into looking at all these little colorful little things. So getting back to what I had mentioned before about these crepuscular butterflies, one of the wonderful phenomena we discovered here were these uh, scarlet eyes and ruby eyes. So there are certain baits and different liquid solutions you can make up. I may, just did my own modified solution. And we found a place on the property really close to the house that's like on a little pass and in between two hills, 
little tiny stretch of trail, not more than a couple hundred feet long, where these skippers converge, and we call it skipper pound. So we started monitoring uh, these crepuscular skippers several years ago, and we've already found 30 species of these, of these crepuscular species. Some of these are extremely, extremely rare in collections anywhere. They're found uh, like at city lights or at a light at a hotel or a lodge somewhere. We actually attract these things in to these baits and you can get right up to them and photograph them. So it's just great, great phenomena that, that we discovered here on the property. So these are the exact same photos that, that are gonna appear in the book. There's some more there, beautiful. Beautiful crepuscular skippers, just amazing. Shot of a few of the hair streaks. So this is the bitter vine, another one that's kind of growing in on our access road that we started monitoring. Brings all these hair streaks out of the canopy that we get to see literally at that knee level. And the black sage. Any little flowers, it brings in mega, mega rare uh, hair streaks and metal marks. So that's the reason why uh, we have so many species on the property, because we live here in the middle of the rainforest, and we've been able to document them basically almost day after day, year after year. So just actually a few weeks ago, not even quite a month ago, my article finally got pub published in Tropical Lepidoptera. Uh, it was six years of uh, monitoring here on the property and three years of writing the manuscript. And it just got published and it's 22 pages long. So if you, if you go online, you can see that article. There's like seven or eight pages of photographs uh, of some of our butterflies. And it, then it goes into details um, how we've been able to document so many species at this one site. And it's, it's been an amazing process in researching, um, doing all the research for this article, trying to find a similar place, even in South America. I, I mean, I found places that were five, 10,000 acres that had, you know, 1,500 or 2,000 species, but I could never, ever find a property, a place, study site this small that had the same amount of species per hectare. I could not find a place. Yeah. We have a very, very special, special part of the a collection, our collection we put on display just during the festival. So we've been doing a lot of this work, most of it, so with the purpose of doing the book, which went to the printer just a few days ago. We've been working on this book for basically all six years doing all the photographs, all the doc documenting the species, the habitats they're in, the elevations they're at. And we finally got this thing finished. There's a sample plate. It will have, the book will have 113 color plates. And there's 15 photos per plate. And the book will also have text. There are almost 300 pages of uh, species accounts for all the butterflies in Honduras. So as far, as far as I'm aware, I think it's going to be the first book printed for any Central American country that covers all six families. So, and these are all photographs of only specimens uh, in Honduras. So that's a, actually a really big feat for us and self-published as well. Um, I know there's some people there that gave us donations for the book and there's been a lot, there's been a lot of great support from uh, a lot of great people out there to help us cover the, the publishing expenses. And so that's the, uh, the book cover right there, the, the front side. It has four of the five uh, new species for the country. So uh, I still have that on there. So we've been working with the uh, Missouri Conservation Heritage Foundation for many years. They helped us uh, publish our bird book. And they've had an account open um, for us for quite a long time for the butterfly book. And so a lot of donations have, have gone into them. And so the last thing here, so this year we're doing as a part of actually our butterfly festival is a conservation tour. 
So proceeds from the event that's coming up in January are going to, to help finish the uh, publication of our butterfly book. So we have quite a few uh, good butterfly name people coming this year. Kim can't come for, for some reasons. And so we'll have different people in different countries here during our event that's coming up in January. So we're gonna have a lot of fun and proceeds will go toward, toward the book. So that basically is just a nutshell of, of our butterfly work here. So let's we'll see if there's any, any questions. I'll take it off stop share, so. Well, that was fantastic, uh, Robert. Uh, I think everybody, uh, the, the, most of the comments are, oh, wow, and that's uh, remarkable. <laughs> and uh, the photographs were really quite spectacular. And uh, most people are just saying very nice things about the, uh, about the slides and your, your stories. And uh, uh, when do you usually have your butterfly event, uh, your festival in January? Yeah, it coincides with the height of the Miss Flower blooming season. So it's, mm. it's right after New Year. The Texas one's in October and, I, and ours is in, is in January. Although we have almost clouds of butterflies all year long on the property. They're, they're, they go through different cycles, different groups come out at different times of year. But uh, January is the month when it's just, you can't imagine the clouds of butterflies in the mist flower gardens and we have the porter weeds, we have the zinnias, we have all these other uh, wild little wild daisies composites along the road. You just you can't spend enough time photographing the butterflies we're trying to get a, some work done now on a cabin we're building before these flowers start opening because when they start opening, we don't get any work done. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is work. <laughs> sort yeah, of. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> Uh, Jeremy Coleman is just sent uh, a note asking if you wouldn't mind revealing the bait you're using. Well, a lot of it's called the Aaron Holds technique. And so it's just a modified version of that. Some people get fish guts and grind them up and ferment them and make it's just a, a stinky mess. All, <laughs> I use, all I use is the water from a tuna can. I don't even use the oil, the oil base is just really smelly. I use water. And I have mix it with the urine. I mean, we use a lot of urine and mud base to attract butterflies, let it ferment, put it in tiny little ice cubes, stick, you know, dilute one of those in a little spray bottle, spray it on a piece of toilet paper to imitate a bird dropping. <laughs> all you're doing is imitating a bird dropping. And so I put green dye, I did an experiment, put green dye in the same solution so we can get photographs of these things not on a white stink bait, but green, they would not go to the green stink bait because it didn't look like a bird dropping. So that experiment failed. <laughs> so whatever, the butterflies come in and that's what's coming. <laughs> uh, Donna, you have a your hand up. Can you uh, unmute yourself? Sure, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, thank you. That was so fun. I'm not a scientist or butterfly expert and it was just so fun to see all the variety. Um, the one, it was about 10 slides up, there was a black and white stripey butterfly. And I noticed that his eyes were also black and white stripey. And I was wondering how many of them use even like all parts of their body to do different kinds of camouflage. Maybe that's common and I just hadn't noticed before. Yeah, there, there are some sulfurs that like, if you look at them close enough, They'll have like a brown stripe that runs through the body and it goes right through the eye. It's really, really strange. If you have high resolution photographs, you start looking at them close enough, you can see all kinds of stuff. You can see scent patches and, and pheromone tufts and all, and all kinds of stuff in there. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> James, uh, James Adams, unmute yourself. You're the only one I know who's ever named a cat after a butterfly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it turns out that um, I, any new cat we get in the family, we name it uh, either after a moth or after a butterfly. And the Ocus hair streak, uh, O-C-H-U-S, um, there's actually a moth that's named Ocus as well as Manduka Ocus. Oh. And 
<laughs> so, um, but I named I named one of our cats Ocas after that hair streak. Uh, I I had a lovely encounter with that hair streak in in Mexico, and that um, memory stayed with me very much when we got that cat. And I thought, well, what's an unusual name? And that one came up, and and so we called it Ocas. <laughs> It's a, it's a black and white cat. It is a black and white cat, of, of uh, yeah. course. <laughs> um, I mean that uh, we try to make we've tried to make the moth name make sense. We have a, a cat right now whose name is Amika, named after the Amika underwing moth we have here, and of course she is orange because the hind wings of the Amika underwing are orange. So okay, <laughs> that makes sense. Who would have thunk it? Uh, Robert, there's a, a Rosemary has sent in an interesting question asking, what's the most interesting mimicry or life cycle you've come across? Well, the, the one photo I showed you of the, of the clear wing sulfur. Hmm. Uh, that's one of the most incredible examples of, of mimicry. Just on this property alone, we have multiple examples of mimicry. Um, we have a sulfur that looks like a, a female cattle heart that's black with the red and white on it. And it's found right, right here on our road. And it, you know, the sulfur is not poisonous, but the cattle hearts are. So there, there are many, many examples. And the, but that clearing sulfur is probably one of the most spectacular ones. Somebody was gonna be asking about, you know, you're finding a lot of these butterflies, obviously a tremendous amount of butterflies, uh, how much life history is missing on all of these, or on many of these? There's, I think there's still a lot. Um, so if you saw one of those kite swallow tails, the beautiful white ones, black bars, um, with a client we had here on a butterfly watching tour, we found one in a cloud forest uh, laying eggs on an endemic soursop. It's only endemic uh, to Honduras. And so this is a kite swallowtail. It's only known from the lowlands of the Caribbean up to 600 meters. We found this up at 1700 meters in the cloud forest. I'd never seen this kite swallowtail. That butterfly has been known for 140 years almost. And there's almost, I don't even know if there's a female in a collection anywhere in the world. And so I have, I made our local guy go up the tree and cut the branches down where it was ovipositing. We got two eggs raised them all the way to pupa, and they're still in the pupa since April. <laughs> so there's another scientist thinks they might be on a sink with the plant in the wild. So maybe when it puts out fresh leaves, it'll hatch. So we're giving them till April to hatch. If they don't, we're gonna publish the life cycle of this beautiful swallow tail. <laughs> wow, wow. Well, the most important question has come up, and that is how much room do you have in your house and how many of us can go to it? <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> no, we're, 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 we're building one cabin now. We don't want to build a big place. We'll probably put a couple more cabins in the next few years. Um, there's a wonderful place where we're putting everybody up only about 15, 20 minutes uh, from us. That's going to be the base hotel. Uh, I think each year for our festival, and from there we go to all the different butterfly watching sites. We use three different sites uh, during uh, the five-day event, and I think we're uh, hopefully we're going to have more people this year. So hopefully we'll pass 300 species. But remarkable. Want to come here and camp out? That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Uh, any last chances? Uh, any last uh, questions uh, for Robert before we let him go? And uh, and everyone else as well. Uh, although you're welcome to stay behind, uh, uh, what I learned from these last couple of uh, meetings with the Massachusetts Butterfly Club is that people, especially uh, local members, like to stick around and tell stories and ask questions, which we will do. But uh, I don't want to hold up Robert. But is there any last questions that anybody has for him? Uh, I have a question, if I could. Yeah. Would Robert, please put uh, put your email in the chat. Just, just did it right when you're speaking. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Why, talk about anticipation. Yeah. So we also have the, the Facebook page, Butterflies of Honduras. Uh, there's a Facebook group, Emerald Valley as well. So basically we post on one, we post on the others. So we post almost every day, birds and the butterflies and other things we find. Are you gonna show the new cabin when it's finished? Was that mom? When it's finished, it's raised up. 
So any, any other last questions? All right, if not, uh, big hand for Robert. Thank you so Thank much you. for um, coming back out here and uh, giving us these stories and uh, a remarkable place for sure. And uh, now that you, now you've given up your email, you're probably going to hear a fair amount from uh, people for uh, perhaps the rest of your life. And uh, that's fine. It's really good. That's fine. All right, you're welcome to stay uh, uh, stay on as well, and anyone else is welcome to stay. Uh, uh, so we'll just open it up to just general 